So, since we have finished chapter one, let's do a brief review. What happened? What's the first event in chapter one? We talked about it last week. The first event, verse one. Right. Jehovah gave Yehuda into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was a great warrior king, but he didn't do this on his own. The first thing we've got to realize is that this was our father's plan, and he gave the land of Judah into his hands. And why did he do that? Do you remember why? Why Israel went into southern um, Why Judah, the southern kingdom? They worshipped other gods. Okay, so they, he told them, he prophesied. Remember back in, in Deuteronomy um, 28, we read that last week. He told them, you know, that with what? Obedience, there's blessings. With disobedience, there's cursings. And if you do not obey and you worship idols, this is going to happen to you. Your enemies are going to come. They're going to overtake you. You're going to be taken to a strange land when you don't understand the language. So it was all prophesied, and they knew it. But it didn't change their behavior. Furthermore, they saw the northern kingdom get taken into captivity into Syria, and they still didn't learn their lesson when they saw what happened to their sisters and brothers in the northern kingdom. They had time to repent, but they didn't. They, they did not. They were disobedient. They didn't keep Torah. They didn't obey, and so they were taken into captivity just as it was prophesied. Okay. Um, so we had the first siege. Um, Nebuchadnezzar comes from Babylon around 605, the first siege, and there goes Daniel and, and his friends, the, um, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The second siege of Jerusalem was, uh, Ezekiel was taken during that time, and then there was a third siege. Um, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah are taken into captivity. They purpose in their heart to obey Jehovah and not defile themselves. They didn't compromise their faith. They stood. Um, Jehovah granted them favor. With obedience, there's blessings. And they entered into the service of, king, of the king. So that's all part of Jehovah's plan. All right, so on your Daniel at a glance chart, you could, on your chapter title for chapter 1, you can write, kind of turn it sideways, and write a title for this chapter that you feel like kind of summarizes the whole chapter. And ours may be different. They're not all going to be exactly alike, but it should kind of, you know, there's only really so many ways you can say a thing that's pretty much the basic thing. Um, what do you think the theme of chapter one would be? If you had to give it a few words, title, what would you talk in title? George showing his power through Daniel and his brothers and uh, how mighty he was. And, uh, okay, but we got to do it in a few words. All right, and, and, and be specific. What happened, that's good, what happened in chapter one specifically? What's the main theme of what happened? Daniel chose to be set apart. Daniel chose not to defile himself. He chose to be set apart. Anybody got something Daniel's else? Daniel's in service to the king, or he begins to seize from the king's okay. service. Okay. So All right. The, the whole thing is Daniel. To the All right. And mine, I'm not saying it has to be like mine. Mine is Daniel and friends enter into the king's service. See how basic that is? That's the main thing of chapter 1. So if you're witnessing to a youth, and they want to know, how do I live in this world today when I'm being tempted and I'm in a pagan world? You're going to remember, oh, Daniel chapter 1, he went into captivity. You're going to know right where to go. Because one, you've read it so many times, you have a good understanding of it, and you can pull out this chart, and you could take somebody to Daniel, and you could just pretty much walk through the whole book of Daniel with them. So the first chapter, Daniel and his friends enter the king's service, or Daniel chooses not to defile himself when taken into captivity. Something along those lines. Okay? So we're going to, as we go through, we're going to kind of fill this chart out together. But we're not ready to fill any of the rest of it out yet. Okay? Alright, any questions about chapter 1 before we move on? Alright? In chapter 2, 
Let's go ahead and get started. Go ahead. You just said Daniel and friends mm -hmm. from 1 6. Is it, are they brothers? Um, spiritually brothers. Oh. They're not physically brothers. Okay. Spiritually brothers. All right. Now, here we are. If you look at the colored area, that's the Neo Babylonian Empire. So this is the area that Nebuchadnezzar's dad, and then he passed away, and then Nebuchadnezzar takes over the throne. And this is the area that is under captivity and considered part of the Babylonian Empire. What were some of the key words that you saw in chapter 2? Some words that were important, some words that were repeated. Sovereign. Sovereign. Very good. Anybody else? What's another word that you saw repeated? Dream. Dream. Okay. What else? King. Wisdom and power. Daniel was always. Interpretation. Interpretation. Very good. What else? You guys are doing great. What about stone? Did you see that repeated several times? Or the word mountain? Daniel? The Chaldeans? Okay. And then as we go through, we'll look at some contrast and things of that nature. But let's go ahead and let's, let's dive into chapter 2. Because my goal is that we want to look at other examples of Daniel's poor observance, his obedience to the Most High God of Israel. We want to examine the facts about the king's dream and the king and the interpretation of his dream. And we want to understand that the God of Israel is the sovereign God over history. And he's going to use three events in the next few chapters to show King Nebuchadnezzar just who he is. Nebuchadnezzar thinks he's the end all. He's just captured Judah. He has taken the vessels from the temple. Um, he captured the nobles and the elites of Judah. He thinks he's Babylonized them, and that's a word. He thinks his kingdom will last forever. It's the greatest kingdom that has ever been on the earth up to this point. So he, he thinks that, you know, he is the end all. But our Father is going to show him there's there's another move on the board. Okay? And that he's going to reveal himself to Nebuchadnezzar. And we're going to see that in chapter 2. He's going to reveal himself to Nebuchadnezzar in a dream. By a dream and its interpretation. And then 3, by rescuing his own children from the fiery furnace. And then in chapter 4, by humbling Nebuchadnezzar. So Nebuchadnezzar realizes his relationship um, to the God of Israel. So he's about to start revealing. Remember how um, Moshe revealed Jehovah to Pharaoh? Remember how he kept coming before him and, and he revealed him and Pharaoh said, yes, you know, he acknowledged that his God, but he never, you know, he didn't accept his God, but he acknowledged that he had a God and then he acknowledged that God had power. It was a, it was a revelation through events that the Pharaoh got to know who the father was and unfortunately it took what it took the, the finally the death of the firstborn and the death of his army and himself to to understand who god really was but in Nebuchadnezzar's case it's going to be revealed to him but in a little different way okay and as we go through this um i'm not really going to go over the homework per se but you'll see answers to the homework as we go through this all right. So Daniel is a book about prophecies of end times and shows us Daniel's life. Um, let's get started. We're still in narrative. We're still in the language is Hebrew. Okay, chapters one through chapter two, verse four is written in Hebrew, and then two four, two, four through chapter seven, the end of chapter seven, is written in Aramaic. But verse one starts out, and it's still written in Hebrew. All right, so what happens in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar? So I want you guys to help answer these questions as we go through it because I want, I want you looking at the text and I want you telling me these answers because we're doing the what, where, when, why together. All right, so what happened in the second? We saw what happened in 
the first year of the reign of Jehoiakim, all right? What happens in the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, the second year? He had a dream, and what, what was his response to that dream? Wait, let's not get ahead. Let's look at just verse 1. What was his response? He was troubled. It troubled him. This dream bothered him. Have you ever had a dream that bothered you? You woke up and for the rest of the day your spirit was kind of troubled um, because you just knew that it meant something or it was supposed to be about something and, and you couldn't quite get to it, what it might have meant. All right, so it was trouble. All right, so more than once, emphasis is placed on Nebuchadnezzar being anxious and troubled over his dream. We'll see that again. All right, and it says his sleep left him. He couldn't sleep. He woke up, had this dream, woke up, and couldn't sleep. Now, in verse 2, what did he do? He couldn't go back to sleep. He was troubled. What did he do in verse 2? All right. He called the magicians, the conjurers, the sorcerer, and all the Chaldeans. What did he call them for? Okay, it says here to tell the king his dream. Not to interpret it, but to tell him the dream. Okay, did you get that? So when you just skim through it, you may not have gotten that. You may have, your brain may have just said, oh, we called him to tell him to interpret the dream. That's not what this says. So don't even remember well, we, we're never told that. We don't know if he did or not. He, it's quite possible that he didn't. He was just so troubled that he needed to know what it was. Or he could have known, he just didn't understand it. Right? And, I want to see if they were wise enough to and we're going to see that in a few verses over. All right, so was, were all of them cold? Who was not here? Who's conspicuously Daniel. absent? Daniel. Daniel and I'm going to say his friends, okay? Um, they weren't there. So he didn't call all of them. He said he just called uh, the magicians, the conjurers, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans. He didn't call all the wise men. Okay? And remember in verse, um, and remember in chapter 1, Daniel was promoted in court and was given wisdom and was considered a wise man in the court name. Alright, so they came and they stood before the king. So here's the term of conclusion. He get, the king gave an order, and what was the result? They came and stood before the king. Now, these seem very simple. Um, some of them, it's like, well, okay, that doesn't tell me a whole lot, but there are going to be some that's going to reveal, when you start getting used to looking for terms of conclusion in these things, it's going to reveal some really powerful truths to you. So this is just helping you get used to that. All right, and in verse 3, what did the king tell them? I had a drink. Okay, I had a dream. And my spirit is anxious to understand the dream. Alright, so in verse 4, uh, it says, and this is where the Aramaic starts. Okay. Then the Chaldean spoke to the king in Aramaic. O king, live forever. And what did they ask Nebuchadnezzar to do in verse 4? Right, tell the dream to your servants. And we are, and we will declare its interpretation. And then in verse five, Nebuchadnezzar makes an interesting demand on these men. Um, what did he demand them, of them? To make the right. known the dream and its interpretation. Exactly. They said, "You tell us the dream, and we'll tell you what it means." How easy is that? Okay, you could just about make up anything, right? But he says, "No, you tell me the dream." and the interpretation. And these men had a choice here. He gave them a choice. He said, the command for me is firm. If you do not make known to me the dream and its interpretation, what's going to happen to them? They will be torn limb to limb. And you're going to see this throughout the book of Daniel. One of the things that history documents about Nebuchadnezzar, he was a he was a very evil man. He was a very evil king. And, you know, every kingdom, let me break here and tell you, kings and kingdoms are synonymous in Scripture. When you see kingdoms or you see kings, those are synonymous. Every ruler of kingdom has their favorite weapons, their favorite uh, battle tactics, strategies, and they have their favorite um, 
ways to punish those who do not do what they want them to do. And Nebuchadnezzar's was that. People would be torn limb to limb. They would have ropes tied to every extremity and, and then tied to the horse's neck, and then the horses would be sent off in opposite directions. And they would literally be torn apart. To add insult to that, their family that was remaining, they would be evicted from their house, their house would be burned down, and all of their stuff burned down. So they wouldn't have a place to go. So the person who was being murdered couldn't have the reassurance that, well, at least my family's okay. Because they knew what was going to happen to their family. They would be left homeless and without anything. So this was um, a very evil man, as you can imagine. And he tells them that's going to happen to him. Life was very cheap to Nebuchadnezzar. People were very expendable. And these were his choice men in court. These were the men who told him when to go to battle, what to do, everything he consulted, all his sorcerers and magicians. But they were expendable. He could always get more. Now, what's the other choice? If they don't tell him the dream and interpretation, they get torn from limb to limb. But what happens in verse 6 if they declare the dream and the interpretation? Gifts and rewards and great honor. All right, you see a therefore. So because of these things, what is the conclusion? So you better tell me the, you better tell me the dream and its interpretation. Right? And there's a contrast in verse 6. If they don't tell the dream and the interpretation, what's going to happen? Death. If they do tell the dream and interpret it, what's going to happen? Rewards. Rewards. Okay. So in verse 7, what's the wise man's response? Yeah. A second time, they, they ask the king, please tell us the dream and we'll interpret it for you. And so in verse 8, the king says, you know guys, this is my paraphrase, you're stalling, but I'm not budging. You're stalling for time because apparently you don't know. He says in verse 8, the king answered and said, I know for certain that you're bargaining for time inasmuch as you have seen that the command from me is firm. So in verse 9, why did the king want them to tell both the dream and its interpretation? What does he say in verse 9? If you do not make the dream known to me, there's only one decree for you. What does he say? What is that? Okay. He says, you're lying. Uh, you're speaking corrupt words before me until the situation has changed. Therefore, tell me the dream that I may know that you can declare me its interpretation. Um, if they were so smart, if they were so smart, they would have known the dream. And he's saying, no, you know what? If you don't tell me the dream, if I tell you the dream, you can lie, you can make up things. But no, the command from me is firm. I want to hear the dream and then... That way, he would know the interpretation was correct. So that makes me think he probably knew what the dream was because if they told him the dream and it was the right dream as he remembered it, then he could trust their interpretation. All right. Um, and then in verse 10 through 11, the wise men respond to the king and they come up with four things. Okay? They answered him and what did they say? What's the first thing they said? No one on earth. So there's not a man on earth who could declare this matter for the king. Inasmuch, okay, these guys were supposed to have all the answers, but they didn't. And if they didn't, then nobody did, basically, is what they're saying. So that's the first thing, is that king, you know, you're asking something that no man can, can do. And what's the second thing they remind the king? No one's ever asked that before. No one's ever asked that before. Okay of any magician or conjurer or, or Chaldean. All right, and what's the third thing? In verse 11, what's the third thing they remind him? This is difficult. Moreover, the thing which the king demands is difficult. Okay? So, no man can do this. Nobody's ever asked a man to do this. This is difficult. And then the fourth thing is, Mr. West said it. What is it? Okay. They say, um, there is no one else who could declare to the king except gods. Now, this is very important. 
Where? Tell me what kind of gods could declare this in verse 11. Could. Okay, take it straight from Scripture. There is no one else who could declare it to the king except gods, whose dwelling place is not with mortal flesh. In other words, out of all of the actually thousands of gods in Babylon, there was not one of them, they're telling Nebuchadnezzar, that could do such a thing as what he was asking. If there is a God that could do that, he's not one here that's with mortal flesh. Okay. Alright, so no one could interpret but the gods, and the gods were out of reach. They didn't communicate. Their gods were gods of wood and stone and, and all of the elements of the earth. Their gods did not, they communicated to their gods, but their gods did not communicate to them in a personal way such as this. Okay. And they may have things like signs, like, okay, the sun shines today, then the sun god is favoring us and we're supposed to do this. But there was no direct communication from gods that could tell them how to what a dream was. So right there they're showing that they're liars and they're condemning themselves. They're, they're, they're casting a light on the fallacy of their own gods, their own worship system. Alright, so... <clears throat> This is important, but that's not our God. That's not our Elohim. Deuteronomy 4, 6, and 7 says, So keep and do them, it's talking about the commandments, the statutes and the judgments, for that is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples who will hear all these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the as Jehovah our Elohim, whenever we call on Him. So, you know what? Our Jehovah is not like their gods. Not like their gods. And Daniel knew that. Okay? His friends knew that. Those from Israel that had been gone into captivity um, knew that. So, it's nice to know that we have, a, we have an, a God, we have an Elohim, that when we call on Him, He is near to us. Not like these gods who, who are not near to them. Alright? And so how did the king respond? Okay? Um, and you know what I'm thinking about too? A, a father that hears us. Remember in the book of Judges? Whenever they would get into trouble, they would do what was right in their own eyes. Then there would be judgment. The enemies would come in and ravage the land or, or, do, or, or, or suppress them. What would they do? They would cry out. And what did the father do when they would cry out? He sent a deliverer. Okay. He sent a judge to deliver them. When they were in Egypt and they cried out, what did he do? He sent a deliverer. <clears throat> so he hears us. He hears our cries. All right, so in verse 12, what did the king do? Okay. Destroy how many of the wise men? Oh. The, not the ones that were there. That told him that. Oh. All of them. So now who did this include? Daniel. Daniel. Okay. And his friends. Okay. So in verse 13, who did the decree include? Who did they look for? Okay. So they weren't there. So they went out to look for them. Okay. The decree went forth that the wise men should be slain. And they looked for Daniel and his friends to kill them. All right, and they remember in chapter one, they were there was none like them. They entered in the king's service. They were considered wise men in the service. So in fourteen, what was Daniel's response? And, and let's pick it apart and let's look at the different words. Daniel replied with what? We want to see what we can learn from his life on how we can respond in a very fearful, difficult situation. All right. Mine says discretion. What is yours says wisdom? Mm -hmm. What is what? Give me some more translations. Daniel replied with what? Discretion and discernment. Discretion and discernment. What is discretion? He didn't. The man he asked. Okay. How, how, what would be discretion? Discretion would be like a cautious, responsible action. Would that? Kind of define discretion. What are some other things? Discretion. Can you think of times? Reason. Reason. 
Can you think of some times in your life where you used discretion and you're so thankful that you did? Can you think of times in your life where you didn't use discretion? And you, <laughs> now I'm getting personal, and you just charged ahead and maybe you whipped out that spiritual sword and slashed somebody to pieces without stopping and thinking and using discretion? All right, so he replied with discretion and discernment. What is discernment? Understanding. Thought. Thought? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What about going beyond the obvious? A wisdom that goes beyond the obvious. And so he replied with discretion and discernment to Ariok. And remember who Ariok was? He was like the chief, chief uh, Chaldean guard. He was the captain of the king's bodyguard who had gone forth to slay the wise men of Babylon. Okay. When evil is surrounding you, it's always best to not get on the same level as the evil. Kind of like, don't return evil for evil. Okay. So Daniel, although he was a young youth, the father had given him wisdom and discernment. These weren't necessarily things. He, Daniel could have been born with these things. I'm sure he had a great degree. I'm sure through growing up learning Torah, he learned of these things. And, and, and the father helped him with these things. But Daniel did not meet evil with evil. Um, let's see. When faced with a difficult situation or difficult people, it is best to use discretion and discernment. That's what I wanted to say there. All right, so how in verse 15 did his reply exhibit discretion and discernment? What did he answer? Uh, he answered and said to Ariok the king's commander. What did he ask him? Why is this urgent? Yeah. Why is this decree so urgent? He asked for an explanation. Instead of panicking, you know, when they came to the killers came to his door, he was level-headed. He used discernment. He used discretion, and he said, "What is so urgent?" He's he's like, "What's tell me the facts? What's going on here?" But you don't see there that this panic, which is a, a great example. All right, and then in verse 16, Daniel shows respect for authority in his response. He went in and he requested of the king. What did he request of the king? Time. Time. Okay. So apparently Daniel was high enough up in rank that he had access to the king. Because you don't just prance yourself in front of the king anytime you want. But he asked permission. Uh, he went in and he requested of the king for time. Let's not be so rushed. Let's think this over. And then this is significant in understanding what to do in a difficult situation. What did Daniel do? In verse 17, the first thing he did was he went to the house of his informed friend and informed his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, about the matter. Why is this important? When you are faced with a difficult situation, who do you go to? You go to those people who understand the Father, who understand His Word. You go to people that you know have reason and discernment. You go to people who know that they'll pray with you. Um, people of integrity. And so he went to his friends, he told them what was going on because it involved them. <clears throat> and so why did he go to them? Did he go to them to say, y'all got to tell me what I need to do? We gotta get out of here. We gotta figure out a way of escape. Did he do that? <clears throat> he went to them in order they might request compassion from the Elohim of heaven concerning this mystery. <clears throat> so he said, so that Daniel and his friends might not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. They didn't want to get killed. They didn't want to be killed. So Daniel's example, he replied with discretion and discernment. He asked for an explanation. He requested time. He went to his friends to go with him before Elohim. Um, he went to Elohim for an ultimate solution and together they prayed. That's an example. That speaks to me. How many times in my life has my world fallen apart and I've just 
don't go to the Father first. I, I, I don't go to my prayer words. Come pray with me right now. I, I, we need to go before the Father. First, you got to think of, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? What am I going to say? Where am I going to go? Or, or you go and tell people, but you're not really seeking a solution from the Father. You're just seeking man's advice. So this is a wonderful example for us. Okay? Um, go to the Father first. That sounds like a no-brainer, but how good are we at doing that? Right? And what was the result of the prayer in verse 19? Right? Uh, the mystery, which was what? The dream, was revealed to Daniel in a night vision. Okay, so Daniel got an answer because he went to Elohim, and Elohim answers prayer. He answers Daniel's prayer. He's waiting to answer our prayers. He's waiting to answer your prayer. But if you do not go to him and seek him, then how is he going to answer your prayer? So he is waiting to answer. Um, all right? And Daniel's response to this revelation. So Daniel doesn't forget to thank the Father for answering his prayer. And how many times? What I think Lynn had this thing up. What if the Father gave you today only the things you thanked him for yesterday? And I thought about that with this. Um, he, the first thing he did after prayer, and the prayer was answered, he went to the Father and he thanked him, and he praised him, and he gave him the glory. And let's look at this, because this is real important in understanding um, about our Heavenly Father. All right, so in verse 19, he says, Then Daniel blessed the Elohim of heaven. And Daniel answered and said, These are truths that we can learn about Yehovah. He says, let the name of Elohim be blessed forever and ever. Now, what's the first truth about Elohim? What's the first truth, he says? What belongs to him? Okay. In verse 20, wisdom and power belong to him. So let the name of Elohim, okay, his name, there's power in his name. The name of Yehovah is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and are safe. Okay, that's one of my favorite scriptures um, from Proverbs. But he says, for wisdom and power belong to him. Do you want wisdom? The fear of Yehovah is the beginning of wisdom. Elohim gives wisdom. It's his to give. It's no one else. No one else can give you wisdom. Asatan will try to steal your wisdom. Nothing else can give you wisdom. Good genes helps. Study helps. But that's only going to take you so far. It's the Father in heaven that gives you wisdom. And in, in the book of James, Yaakov, it says that we're to, if, if you're in need of wisdom, that you're to ask and ask without doubting. And he will give you the wisdom that you ask for. It's his to give. I always remind Katie of that when she's taking a test. I say, do your best. Study hard. But you've got to know, okay, it's the wisdom comes from above. You've got to ask the Father to give you wisdom. You do the preparation, you do the groundwork, but it's His to give you. All right? So we're to ask Him because it's His to give. And then in verse 21, what else do you learn about Yehovah? Nothing? All right. It is he who changes the times and the epochs or the seasons. Right. It is not Mother Nature. I just wanted to give you a clue. There is no such thing as Mother Nature. Flash, flash. It, or Father Time. It is the God Most High, El Elyon, that changes the seasons and the times. And what does he do in verse 21? Mm -hmm. He removes kings and establishes kings. Okay. That's important for us to understand. There is nothing on the face of this earth that he does not have control over. He sets kings up. He removes kings. His purpose is going to be brought about. And in chapter 1, we saw that in verse 2 because he gave Jehoiakim into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar. Did he not? And that's just a good example of that. All right, and then what does he give to wise men? Wisdom. Wisdom. All right, and that's 
as Daniel and his friends. He gave them wisdom. And he gives knowledge to men of understanding. What's the difference between wisdom and knowledge? Is there a difference? Okay. That's a good. Did you hear that? Wisdom is how you use knowledge. Knowledge is a is um it's it's an it's an understanding. It's a gaining.